Hello and welcome to our monthly webinar series on Asian health brought to you by the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE for short, and the Stanford Health Library. My name is Bryant Lin and I am one of the co-directors of the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. I'm really happy to bring to you a wonderful talk by my brilliant colleague, Dr. Lata Palanyapan, who is co-director with me of the center. Uh, Dr. Palanyapan will be talking today about how do your genes affect your medication response. Uh, Dr. Palanyapan is an internist and clinical researcher. Her research has focused on the study of diverse populations, chronic disease, and prevention. Dr. Palanyapan specifically seeks to address the gap in knowledge of health in Asian subgroups and other understudied race, racial ethnic minorities. During her time at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, as the medical director of, the, of clinical research, she led organization-wide initiative to collect patient race, ethnicity, and language information, enabling PAMF researchers to conduct disparities research using electronic health records. She was co-founder of PRANA, a South Asian wellness program. Her current work examines the clinical effectiveness of structured physical activity programs for diabetes management, as well as the best exercise regimens for normal weight diabetics. She was recently awarded a Mid-Career Investigator Award by the National Institutes of Health to provide mentoring to junior clinical investigators in the conduct of patient-oriented research. She's currently working on implementation of evidence-based genetic and pharmacogenetic testing in primary care clinics as the Scientific Director of Precision Genomics and Pharmacogenomics in Primary Care. She is the Faculty Co-Director of the Stanford Biobank designed to accelerate translatable scientific discoveries. She co-founded the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE, at Stanford in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Latha Palanyapa. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, and thank you everyone who's joining us uh, today. We have about 100 registered uh, participants and um, we have the Q&A function open. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A and Dr. Lin uh, will present them at the end of the talk. So today we're gonna to talk about how do your genes affect your medication response? And our goal at Stanford is to provide the right dose of the right drug at the right time for every patient. And we are really at the forefront and cutting edge of doing this at Stanford Medicine. Next slide. So this is inspired by all of our patients who at one time or another, and I'll show you the data on uh, the first 50 patients in the human-wide study today, that where over 90% of people had something in their genome that was helpful to them in terms of their medication dosing and prescribing. And so this is um, a patient that we had in the human-wide study that we presented at the Big Data and Precision Health Conference. And she came to us with an important question uh, prior to getting surgery, asking, why doesn't Vicodin work for me? And we looked at her genome and we were able to assess that her CYP2D6 enzyme was not a variant that processed Vicodin appropriately. And we were able to tell her prior to getting shoulder surgery that she should use alternatives like morphine as opposed to Vicodin, which needs to is a prodrug and needs to be um, metabolized by 2D6 into morphine. So this is an example of the kind of changes that we can make for personalized prescribing. Next slide. So what is pharmacogenomics? So all of us as physicians and patients know that not all people respond to the benefits and side effects of medications the same way. And pharmacogenomics are inherited the same way as our ear, hair color or eye color, but it's not something that we um, sit around at the Thanksgiving table and talk about how did you respond to Vicodin or um, clopidogrel or warfarin, any number of the um, medicines that I'll talk about today. So pharmacogenomics is the study of how your genes can influence your response to medications. Your genetic variations can determine how medication is absorbed, metabolized, and processed by your body, and how this may interact with other medications or supplements. So we refer to this as drug-drug 
and drug-drug gene interactions, in addition to drug gene interactions. Next slide. So why pharmacogenomics? We want to save patients money on medication. So we want to find the right medication for the patient without trying to switch medications. And it takes the guesswork for us as physicians out of prescribing treatments. And importantly, and I'll give an example of this upcoming in the talk, we really want to reduce the side effects of medications so uh, people don't have adverse events with medications, which, which sometimes occurs. Next slide. So we have observed in population-based studies that patients with the same condition, after undergoing DNA profiling, we can identify good responders, people who don't respond, and those with bad effects. The good news is that those with bad side effects and people who don't respond well are a relative minority of the population. So five to 10% of the population at maximum for each drug. Next slide. So when we talk about drug metabolism, we use the acronym ADME. ADME stands for A for absorption. So this is whether you put the drug in your mouth. So um, and how it is absorbed in your GI tract. D is for distribution, how your heart pumps this medication around to your blood and whether it's hydrophilic and might stay in the plasma or hydrophobic or store in a fat. And then metabolism, which is mostly done in the liver. So 90% of our drugs are metabolized in the liver. And most of these are metabolized in the cytochrome P450 system. So you can see that uh, cartoon on the right um, for cytochrome P450. And, and E is for excretion. Most of our drugs are excreted in our kidneys. A few are uh, excreted in our gut through bile, but most are excreted through kidneys. And most of the enzymes that we know about right now with regard to drug metabolism are focused in the liver. So you'll see a lot of the enzymes um, start with CYP uh, and that stands for cytochrome P450. Next slide. So we in the Bay Area have a diverse population and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in upcoming slides. And so it's especially important for us to understand how medications work in diverse populations. And we have several examples of where drugs don't work as well in diverse populations or different drugs should be used. And that raises our clinical radar and antenna to look out for other differences that we can find in order to increase precision prescribing. Next slide. So this is just an example of some of the pharmacogenetic differences that we've found uh, specific to specifically uh, with regard to Asian populations, which are quite common in the Bay Area. One third of the Bay Area is Asian. And I'll go deeper into cardiology uh, drugs, including cholesterol-lowering drugs, such as Crestor, Warfarin, which is an um, anti-clotting drug, which is often prescribed for people with arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation. And then uh, Plavix, which is also a drug that is used to prevent clotting after cardiac events. There's also differences in oncology drugs, particularly uh, tamoxifen, which is metabolized by CYP2D6, similar to the Vicodin example, which I uh, just told you about, and, um, and also um, HIV medications and antifungals, so infectious disease and rheumatology drugs as well. Next slide. So there are many factors that can contribute to the observed race ethnic difference. There are some physiologic differences, which we'll discuss, pathophysiologic differences, genetic differences, and pharmacogenetic differences, which we'll discuss today. There may be environmental factors, for instance, how much alcohol you drink can induce uh, liver enzymes, as well as smoking, caffeine, um, these can all uh, lead to differential metabolism of drugs, as well as idiosyncratic reactions. And all of these can interact and be quite multifactorial in terms of determining 
interracial ethnic differences in exposure and or response to drugs. Next slide. So there are many differences that we have learned by studying diverse populations. There's differences in biomarker prevalence, uh, and we will see an example of this with factor V Leiden mutation, which is more common in those of European ancestry. Differences in safety and efficacy. So with asthma, we've discovered differences in metabolism of beta agonists uh, in studying African ancestry patients, in part due to two uh, genetic variations. I'll talk a little bit more about C2C19 variants and metabolism and how they're different in East Asian versus South Asian ancestry. Differences in HLA B1502, um, which affect metabolism of carbamazepine and leads to a very severe uh, skin reaction uh, with uh, people with variants in HLA B1502. Um, and carbamazepine is uh, prescribed for seizure disorders. And there's also differences um, in understanding um, pathways. So we have new scientific discoveries with regard to factor two deficiency, which is a rare bleeding disorder with a higher prevalence among Latin populations, Latinx populations. So study of diverse populations in general helps us understand disease pathophysiology discover new treatments and personalized care. So we will talk about all of these examples today. Next slide. So this is how I uh, describe drug metabolism to my patients. So most people, 90% of people are normal metabolizers for most of the enzymes that we're going to discuss today. And so this means traffic is flowing normally in the liver. And if you think of normal uh, traffic as being two lanes on the highway, most people are normal metabolizers. And this is why um, when FDA uh, is um, approving drugs, they're looking at a majority of the population that this drug is working well. So these are normal metabolizers. Next slide. There are some people that are intermediate metabolizers. So they have one lane on the highway. And this is okay if you are maybe using only one drug that is metabolized by this pathway. But in some cases, you might be using two drugs and then there's a traffic jam if you're an intermediate metabolizer. So this is why it's important to consider not only drug gene interactions, but also drug drug gene interactions. Next slide. Then we have people who are rapid or ultra metabolizers. So these are people who have three lanes on the highway. And, and this is important to consider when we have prodrugs that need to be metabolized into the active form. And if people, for instance, are rapid metabolizers of uh, Vicodin, they might get some of the side effects like respiratory depression but the pain relief goes by very quickly. And so these people might be asking for um, more and more um, pain relief through Vicodin, and they might be mislabeled as drug abusers, but really they're rapid metabolizers and they're uh, metabolizing um, the coding very fast and not getting pain relief that lasts a long time, as you would see with normal metabolizers. Next slide. And then there are people with uh, poor metabolism. So these are people who have no lanes on the highway. And in those cases, we need to be very careful about giving drugs that are metabolized um, uh, through these pathways. Next slide. So I'm gonna give you an example first of uh, treatment of high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease in Asian populations. Next slide. So Crestor is a very commonly used drug to lower cholesterol. I'm currently working on the Clinical Pharmacology Implementation Consortium guidelines for cholesterol. And this is one of the drugs that we have uh, special consideration. Next slide. Because Crestor is normally prescribed at 10 milligrams, but the FDA label warns not to do this for Asians in particular. Next. Because of differences in P1B1 in the um, 
the liver that is transcribed by an enzyme called SLC01V1. And variants in this um, have Asians metabolize um, this drug more slowly. Next slide. So for Asians, Crestor at a lower dose is recommended, five milligrams in general. But we want to watch out for generalizing this term Asians because, next slide, this has only been studied in Chinese and Koreans, but this is extrapolated to all Asian subgroups. And we'll see some examples later of where uh, Asian subgroups differ widely. And so you can't take data from one Asian subgroup and extrapolate it to another. Next slide. Now I'm gonna go through an example for warfarin. So warfarin is a drug that we give to prevent clotting. And there are differences in CYP2C9, next slide, that recommend decreased dosing for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean patients. Next slide. There's also differences in VCORC C1, which recommend increased dosing for Blacks, African Americans, and Asian populations. So it's important to look at a, a, uh, a patient's CYP2C9 variant, as well as the VCORC C1. So in real life, what we do is we take all of these variants and we put them into a warfarin dosing algorithm to decide what the initial dose of warfarin uh, should be. Next slide. The third example that I'm gonna use for cardiovascular disease is uh, Plavix or clopidogrel. So this is a medication that's commonly prescribed after someone has a cardiac event, maybe a stent is placed to prevent clotting of the stent. Uh, next slide. So there are differences in the CYP2C19 enzyme, which is also in the liver part of the cytochrome P450 system. And clopidogrel is one of those drugs that I mentioned that's a prodrug that um, is, as I mentioned with the ADME, it's absorbed in the intestine. And next slide. The differences in CYP2C19 in the liver uh, determine the amount of active metabolite that can be used to prevent uh, platelet aggregation and block ADP binding. Next slide. And there are differences in this cytochrome P450 enzyme, CYP2C19, wherein there's a loss of function mutation and increased risk of clotting in Japanese patients, Korean patients, and Chinese patients, and a gain of function mutation, which is related to increased risk of bleeding in Asian Indian patients. And this is quite common. So one in four Japanese patients, one in seven Korean patients, one in 10 Chinese patients, one in four Asian Indian patients. And these variants are not seen almost at all in Caucasian patients, so less than 1% of Caucasian patients, and very few African-American patients as well. Next slide. CYP1A2, so this is a, um, a uh, enzyme that metabolizes a drug that we all commonly take, caffeine. Next slide. And um, CYP1A2 can be induced by cigarette smoking. Next slide. And we find that this interaction in Japanese uh, smokers, they have a variant, uh, star one c that decreases caffeine metabolism with smoking. Next slide. And a different variant in Caucasian smokers, star one f increases caffeine metabolism. So we have a lot to learn about race ethnicity, the different variants, and how drugs are metabolized. Uh, based on these variants. Next slide. So this, these are some results from our human-wide study. So uh, these were 50 patients uh, in a pilot study funded by the Dean's office, looking at if pharmacogenomics would be useful um, for most patients who are coming through primary care. So here we looked at the workhorse enzymes, uh, CYP2D6, CYP2C19, CYP2C9. So together, these enzymes metabolize about 50 to 60% of all drugs. And SLC01B1, so this is the one that metabolizes statins, which is a commonly used drug. Uh, 
that 91% of patients had at least one genotype in one of these that was considered to be high risk. And we are defining a high risk genotype as one in which a change in dose or medication should be considered. So you can see on the Y axis, we have the number of patients. And on the X axis, those who had no high risk genotypes, one high risk genotype, two high risk genotypes, three or four. And so you can see we have a nice uh, bell curve there. And there's very few people that have uh, nothing to worry about in terms of these workhorse enzymes, but it's still reassuring to know that all, all of the medications that we might prescribe that we currently have data on, um, that, uh, that there would be no changes in, um, in dosage or uh, prescribing. Next slide. So this is an example that we often talk about in the Center for Asian Health uh, Research and Education, and Dr. Uh, Lin speaks so eloquently about a patient of his who had an HLA B5801 variant, which is much more common in, in Asian patients. Um, so you can see the um, estimate in Caucasians and Hispanics versus African Americans versus Asians. And um, the, the risk in Asians is almost 10 times as high in having this variant. And the relative risk of having allopurinol associated, so allopurinol is a medication that we use for gout, severe um, cutaneous, which means skin-related adverse reactions. And you can see that uh, both African-Americans and Asians have a much higher, so three times the relative risk of allopurinol associated um, skin reactions. Next slide. So let's take a deeper dive into Asians um, in the Bay Area. So Asians make up 60% of the world's population, 6% of the US population, and 30% of the Bay Area. And we have a microcosm of the world in the Bay Area. So excellent representation of every Asian subgroup in the world is represented in the Bay Area. Next slide. And yet less than 1% uh, to be um, precise, 0.17% of NIH funding goes to Asian related research. Next slide. Asians are also underrepresented in clinical trials. So as I mentioned, Asians make up 60% of the world's population, as you can see in the pie chart on the right, and 12% of those that participate in global clinical trials. So these are the trials that we use to bring drugs to market, and Asians are quite underrepresented in these global clinical trials. Next slide. So decisions around Asian health are made using mainly non-Asian data. And as you can see from the couple of examples that I presented so far, and the examples that I'll present going forward on diverse populations in general, this is a problem. And uh, I'm currently working on a grant application actually to increase um, the genetic diversity that we have in the human cell atlas um, because most, and, and we'll see a slide on this, most of the genetic data is, is um, non-diverse as well. Next slide. So let's take an example in, in other uh, diverse populations. So I'll take uh, blood clotting disorders in European and Latinx populations as our next example. Next slide. So factor five Leiden mutation. So factor five is part of our uh, clotting um, cascade. Next slide. And uh, we need factor five in order to clot. And sometimes there's a mutation, which is most common in European ancestry. And this is actually named after a town in the Netherlands, uh, Leiden. And so people are heterozygous, about three to 8% of the population. Um, and those are homozygous as one in 5,000. And this uh, represents very uh, severe uh, clotting disorders among European populations. Next slide. There's also a factor two deficiency. Next slide. That is also part of the coagulation cost cascade. And you can see where uh, factor two fits in. This is called prothrombin deficiency. 
Next slide. And this is uh, generally um, uh, present in one in two million people, so very rare bleeding disorder. But we see a higher incidence among uh, Latino populations. So this is something that we might want to screen for more in uh, the diverse populations that we have in the Bay Area. Next slide. So what can we do? as uh, physicians and patients as we move forward. And, and one thing that I always say in my talks is that I predict all of us in 10 years will have uh, pharmacogenetic testing. It is getting more and more affordable and we're having more and more information uh, that we can utilize to um, do precision prescribing. Next slide. So at Stanford, uh, we um, are fortunate to have uh, really the um, the father of this field, Russ Altman, and uh, Dr. Russ Altman taught me pharmacogenomics about five years ago when we started the clinic in pharmacogenomics in our um, concierge and executive health program. And so this is a database that, that calls all of the scientific literature and provides information on 647 drugs and 133 pathways, provides uh, dosing guidelines, um, and this um, takes information from all areas of the world, um, including the Dutch uh, pharmacogenomics working group and, um, and compiles data also on drug labels from around the world. Um, next slide. And then um, we have specifically, and this is part of the consortium that I'm working on for the statin guidelines, the clinical pharmacogenetics implementation consortium. So this tells us as physicians when we see these pharmacogenetic variants, when do we have strong evidence to change uh, dosing or prescribing, and uh, when is the evidence a little bit weaker and helps us identify areas that we need more evidence. Next slide. So this is an example of a report um, that we get at Stanford uh, in our pharmacogenetics uh, consultations. Next slide. So you can see some of the enzymes uh, that we talked about already today, CYP2D6, CYP2C19, VCORT C1, SLC01B1, CYP1A2. And these enzymes um, can tell us about 400 different drugs. So we look at these 25 uh, different areas of the genome, these variants, and it can tell us about 400 drugs including uh, commonly used cardiac drugs, antidepressants, anticoagulants, statins, antivirals, opioids, and also over-the-counter analgesics. Um, next slide. So uh, this goes back to our study in human-wide uh, where we did pharmacogenetics consultation on uh, 50 patients. So on the y-axis, you see the number of recommendations that we made, and on the x-axis, the different classes of drugs in which they were made. So psychiatric drugs, statins, isoniazid, opioids, clopidogrel, antihypertensive medications, and we made either preemptive recommendations. So that is a recommendation um, made before the person was actually on the drug, but they had a high likelihood of being on the drug given their medical and family history. So for instance, if people had a family history of cardiovascular disease, we made a preemptive recommendation on statins because um, most, um, people who have a family history of uh, cardiovascular disease at some point in their life do go on these cholesterol lowering drugs. And then reactive recommendations are those in which um, people are already on the drugs and then we're making um, recommendations to lower the dose or change the drug. Next slide. And then um, looking at our phenotypic results based on select genes. So on the left-hand side, you see the pilot study, the human-wide pilot study. And the right-hand side, uh, the general population level estimates for these different enzymes, CYP2D6, CYP2C19, CYP2C9, and SLC01B1. And you can see in general, our uh, pilot population was less likely to have normal metabolism. And this may be due to the fact that our population is more diverse. So you can see that the referent group, the larger populations that have been studied, um, and we'll take a look at, at how diverse groups are underrepresented in 
what we deem to be the population um, prevalence estimates are mostly Caucasian. And in our pilot study, as you know, by the Bay Area, only 50% Caucasian, so more diversity represented. And um, there may be more um, variants that uh, are concerning in terms of drug metabolism in uh, diverse populations. Next slide. And we did analyze our Stanford primary care patients. So we looked at electronic health records of 45,000, over 45,000 patients, almost 50,000 patients. And we saw that based on their current drug profiles and the population prevalence of these variants, that about 10% of our population was deemed to be at high genetic risk. About 10 to 40%, uh, sorry, about 15% uh, is at medium genetic risk. So 10 to 40% likelihood of having to change uh, a medication or change um, the dose of a medication. 30% um, is at low genetic risk and 50% uh, have no current genetic risk. And this is for reactive uh, recommendations. So in terms of preemptive recommendations, I also say it would be great to have everyone have pharmacogenetic testing at birth um, because then we have many more years to utilize this information in our prescribing. And at one point or another in our lives, uh, we are prescribed drugs that can be informed by uh, the current pharmacogenetic variants that we're studying. Next slide. So now let's talk about pharmacogenomics for the underserved. So it's very important as we move forward with um, the cutting edge of medicine that we do not leave people uh, behind. And often when we incorporate new technologies, we increase uh, the digital and technology divide. So, so let's take a look at some of the data here. Next slide. So as I mentioned, genomics is failing on diversity. So on the left-hand pie chart you see in 2009, we had about 1.7 million samples in 373 uh, genetic studies, and 96% of those were of European ancestry. Uh, fast forward to 2016, and we have many more studies, 2,511 studies, 35 million samples, so many more samples, and yet we haven't increased the diversity as much as we could have. And this is something that we're working on at Stanford. I'm submitting a grant for this now. Um, and um, as we mentioned, those of Asian and non-European ancestry are very underrepresented in, in genomics. And that gives us less information on pharmacogenomics as well. So this is important um, going forward to have more diverse populations participate in the research so we can do um, better precision prescribing for all of our patients. Next slide. This is a slide on telehealth use by race ethnicity, which is not exactly uh, the pharmacogenomics, but this may give us a clue as to where we might find disparities in pharmacogenomics. And, and we are writing a grant on pharmacogenomics specifically to partner with our federally qualified healthcare centers so that we can bring uh, pharmacogenetics technology um, to underserved populations. So you can see here that telehealth use um, in general, about 50% have no use of uh, telehealth. And this is overrepresented in Asian and Hispanic populations who are more likely to not use telehealth. Next slide. And when we consider um, new technological innovations, we have to remember that uh, some people, uh, some groups are using uh, smartphones only. And um, for instance, the, the pharmacogenomic software that we use um, is web-based and is not available through phones. So as we think about new pharmacogenomics technologies, we should think about ones that can be um, used by populations who are primarily smartphone users. Um, and you can see there are vast race ethnic differences in terms of the number of um, portion of households with broadband internet. So 65% of Hispanic households 
uh, versus 71% of black households versus 80% of white households have broadband internet. Next slide. So not enough is known about pharmacogenomic testing in minority groups to assess whether they are um, more or less likely to use pharmacogenetic testing. Though we at Stanford are committed to bringing pharmacogenomic testing equally to all race ethnic minority groups and those um, with varying levels of socioeconomic status um, so that we can improve health of of all of our populations equally. Next slide. And um, it's important for us to remember that equality is not the same as equity. Uh, so I show this cartoon in um, my population health classes um, to the first year medical students. And equality means that you're giving everyone an equal amount. So let's say pharmacogenetic testing costs $100 for everybody. That would be equality, but equity is giving more to groups that need more. So perhaps for, for some groups that are underserved, we're actually making pharmacogenetic testing free or low cost and, and um, charging $100 to the people who can afford to pay. So this would ensure more equitable uh, distribution of these new technologies, including pharmacogenetic testing. And our goal is to um, reduce health disparities, which we've identified in many different diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension. And, and it is my hope that pharmacogenomics can bring us closer to uh, reducing health disparities and bringing health equity to, to everyone. Next slide. So we have done uh, case reports on um, interpreting these variants um, in car current pharmacogenetic testing. And, and this is important for consumers because there's many companies that offer direct to consumer pharmacogenetic testing. And we found um, through a patient who came to us with outside pharmacogenetic testing compared to the pharmacogenetic testing that was done in our uh, vetted Stanford lab, that there was differences in variant interpretation where the outside lab um, uh, sort of uh, called the variant as intermediate uh, metabolizer when, when she was actually a normal metabolizer for, for one of the very large enzyme groups, which um, created sort of undue uh, anxiety and frustration. So it's very important as we move forward to use um, guidelines that are vetted by uh, scientists um, from around the world, like the Clinical Pharmacology Implementation Consortium, as opposed to relying on individual uh, companies to do their own variant interpretation. So I encourage you to, to, to look at this if, if you are to um, undergo pharmacogenetic testing yourself, um, because it can be a tower of Babel, and it's important to have um, a good interpreter uh, for this information. Next slide. So where do we go with pharmacogenomics 2.0? So as I mentioned, pharmacogenetic testing can provide information on the medications you currently take and potential medications you may need to take in the future. So that's preemptive recommendations. So this can ensure you take the right medications um, at the right dose for you. Um, and, and this is just some information on pharmacogenetic testing at Stanford Healthcare. So this is just a saliva uh, test, um, similar to COVID test many of you have maybe taken, uh, which you mail in. And then you have a consultation with a pharmacogenetics expert uh, who uh, at this time is, is me or uh, Dr. Russ Altman. And so there's the phone number to contact and you can also look us up on the internet if you just put in uh, Stanford um, pharmacogenomics and personalized wellness, you'll find uh, this information on pharmacogenetic testing. Next slide. Um, so with that, I will stop and uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm looking forward to um, hearing from the audience. Great, thank you so much for a wonderful doc, Dr. Palaniapan. Uh, we have many, many questions. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, uh, but let me cherry pick a few. Uh, early question uh, from an anonymous attendee, how readily available is one's genomic information and how often is this currently used when medications are prescribed? So we are still in the early days. Um, if you wanna think of it as uh, 
you know, Model T and not yet a Tesla in terms of incorporating pharmacogenetic testing into our daily interactions. But I do think that this is, um, uh, the costs are decreasing rapidly. So currently the cost of pharmacogenetic testing at uh, Stanford is about $1,200 for the test as well as the interpretation. Um, but I anticipate in a decade that these costs will be um, around the $100 range. And uh, this then will be something that um, more people uh, can use. So still early days of the automobile though with this technology. Commodore 64, not Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then a practical question from Eileen Ying, I think you touched on this, at least at Stanford, but perhaps you can uh, generalize. How do you please advise how to request the uh, testing of pharmacogenetics genomics? Uh, do we need referring or prescription from a physician? So I think you touched on this at Stanford. How do you how does one go about this outside of Stanford? And you talked about reliability and you know, of the other issues of um, you know, concern for kind of um, less reputable uh, places. Uh, how do we go about this? So excellent question. So, um, and thank you, uh, Chloe Salas for, for putting the pharmacogenomic testing um, link at Stanford. So you can self-refer. Um, and uh, we, we looked at the landscape of all the pharmacogenetic testing companies about four years ago, and I'm continually reevaluating this um, and have most recently done so in the last month. But we were looking for companies that adhered most to these clinical pharmacology implementation consortium guidelines. So these are guidelines that um, a bunch of experts come together and decide how the variants should be classified and interpreted and what drug changes should be made. So we looked for companies who adhere to the CPIC guidelines. And we looked for companies that um, considered not only drug gene interactions, but drug-drug gene interactions uh, for those intermediate metabolizers. And also because people um, use more than one drug. So it's important to consider if they're gonna get traffic jams with the intermediate metabolizers. And also uh, we picked a company um, which is in Vitae, just so people know what company we use at Stanford currently, um, that, um, that also um, incorporates nutraceuticals and herbal medications because many of our patients take um, um, traditional Asian medicines, alternative medications like St. John's wort for depression. And so it's important to be able to incorporate those in, in terms of understanding our pharmacogenetic response. And uh, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, Sarah Choi asks and, and a very practical question. Do insurance companies cover pharmacogenomic testing? So just last summer, um, Medicare uh, changed the, um, the coverage guidelines. Uh, they're still quite complex. So uh, for instance, um, I told you we do a panel with 25 different variants that tells us about 400 drugs. So current insurance guidelines are only to test for one of those variants for one of the drugs. So it, and it's, um, the amount of reimbursement is not the same as what the costs are uh, currently for the uh, commercially available panels because we're doing more uh, panel testing. And that makes more economic sense than, um, you know, for instance, for every drug that you take to submit a saliva sample and just to test one variant at a time cost wise, it makes sense to test more variants. And, and the, the current uh, Medicare guidelines are allowing for if you're taking two or three of the medications to do panel testing. Though, again, we're at very early days just taking baby steps um, with uh, insurance reimbursement. I'm, I'm talking um, in the next week or two with our, our hospitalist colleagues to, um, to talk about whether this is something that is good to do uh, for pain control in the hospital, for instance, when you're admitted with a surgery. Um, one of the um, limitations is also the turnaround time. So the turnaround time for pharmacogenetic testing currently is about two weeks. Um, so we need to decrease that turnaround time to, to make it really useful for, for inpatient medicine. And what about private insurance? You mentioned Medicare, private insurance similar or is it all over the map? 
so it's all over the map and um, and there are uh, some insurers that are um, allowing uh, for a reimbursement for for depression, uh, particularly so multi gene panels for depression. Um, and, and that is something that we we hope to um, uh, start at Stanford. Um, as we near the, the beginning of the end of the pandemic so so more to come this summer. And people can do people often use their HSA FSA dollars for this? Yes, you can use um, HSA FSA dollars for this. Great. Well, just moving back a little bit more to the science, um, Ramohan Rao, I apologize if I mess up your name, has many, many questions. Why don't we go to the first two? Do pharmacogenomic tests involve analysis of SNPs, uh, specific gene mutations or protein modifications? Why don't you take that first one and then we'll go to the second one or his or her second one. Okay, um, so so yes, it does uh, measure SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and I'll point out that most of these SNPs have been identified in Caucasian populations. So there, so we do need more diverse populations to be in these pharmacogenetic trials, so we can identify um, uh, less common SNPs in European populations, which may be more common in. Um, Asian or other populations, as we saw with the uh, example with the HLAs and allopurinol. Uh, so we have a long, long way to go. Um, though there are other researchers at Stanford. So at the last uh, Stanford Health Library talk, we had Dr. Eric Gross uh, and Dr. Chi Hong Chen talking about a breath test for CYP2 um, C19 polymorphisms. So, so this is a very exciting way that at the point of care, that we would be able to, um, to uh, understand phenotypes of the patients that we're, we're treating uh, and not only the genotypes. So this is um, uh, something that we'll be able to incorporate more going forward. And, and second question was, looking into the future, will pharmacogenomic tests be carried out prior to given, giving medications preemptively or post-medication? after noting del deleterious effects or, you know, maybe lack of response, when, what's the good in, in the workflow of, of medicine, clinical medicine, where does pharmacogenomics fit in? Well, as I said, I hope it's at birth. So, so when our, our babies are born, maybe a little bit of saliva getting the pharmacogenetic testing and having that uh, on file. So we're working with companies now to have it integrated with the electronic health record so that we can get what I call pop alerts. So point of prescription alerts. So currently I go through and I, I think of based on their uh, family history and their medical history, what, which of these 400 drugs might my patient encounter in their lifetime? And then I give them specific recommendations on on these things and you know it is in their medical record and they would have to search in the future if they're um, being prescribed for, for instance um, a proton pump inhibitor in the future you know what um, variant might influence that however you know we hope that in the future if someone puts in omeprazole it might say oh give this person a lower dose because they might have more side effects given their um, cytochrome p450 variant so um so again we're doing studies on this for um you know large uh healthy populations um so far pharmacogenomics has mostly been studied on um and shown to be cost effective on people who are very sick discharged from the hospital and um, looking at outcomes like readmission or um, adverse events or drug-drug uh, and drug-drug gene interactions in people who are very sick uh, taking many medications. So um, it's more cost-effective in, in those populations, but in large primary care populations, I think it will take longer amounts of time for these small wins to add up over a lifetime to be cost-effective. Great. There are a couple of questions on pharmacogenomics, I guess genomics, maybe not pharmaco, depending on, I guess, how you include vaccines, but, and the COVID vaccines. Are there any research and genetic response to vaccines, and specifically COVID vaccines? So um, we, we talked about this um, at, a, at another talk uh, that I was at. So there, there has been making headlines some um, um, 
thought that in, in a synthetic data set, so again, this is you know basically just uh, a, a data set that is, is not people, but based on different um, MHC and HLA polymorphisms, so major histocompatibility complex and human leukocyte antigen differences across race ethnicities, that there might be lower vaccine efficacy. And this is work that Dr. Lin and I have done together. However, when you look at the actual clinical trial data, um, there's, there's a hint that there might be lower vaccine efficacy, but the, the sample sizes were simply too small to conclusively show that vaccine efficacy is different in uh, race ethnic minority groups. That said, um, this is something that, that we're uh, actively studying and Dr. Lin and I um, have a collaboration with um, Sutter and we're looking at Sutter data to see, it, and Stanford data to see if, if now that most uh, people are vaccinated, um, if we might see more people um, of, of specific race ethnic populations who despite vaccination uh, still get COVID and, and the jury is still out on that. But I, I will emphasize that the headlines you see are on synthetic data and not uh, real populations hinting at less um, efficacy in uh, racial ethnic minority groups. Great, fantastic. I know this is, I, I picked another question because I know it's something you're interested in. What effect does being biracial or multi-ethnic multi have on one's pharmacogenomics? So that is an excellent question. So um, I, I often quote the statistic that one out of seven babies born uh, now are mixed race. So two or more race ethnicities. And this is something that we need to study going forward. And we do have active studies in this area looking at mixed race populations at CARE at the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. And, and um, uh, and of mixed race populations, many are, are mixed race of Asian heritage and ancestry. So um, in, in terms of pharmacogenomics, it's important to study um, variants in uh, specific race ethnic groups so we understand mixed race variants better. And then um, we are hoping that as pharmacogenomics becomes more and more prevalent that um, you know, we won't need to look at uh, race ethnicity as a shorthand for, for instance, if you might have a CYP2C19 polymorphism, which is more common in Japanese or Chinese patients, that we will actually be able to test. So not to say, oh, one in four Chinese patients have this polymorphism, but actually we can test to see if you are that one in four or three and four who don't have the polymorphism. So as testing becomes more, more cost-effective, uh, we'll be able to get at the heart of the matter more quickly. Great, fantastic. Of course, being in Silicon Valley, we cannot, uh, we have to have a question about machine learning uh, from Wu Sung James Kim. Are there machine learning studies regarding pharmacogenomics uh, that are promising? So, so machine learning, um, you know, we are doing to find, you know, which populations might benefit most from uh, most treatments. And we are um, just at the beginning of, of trying to do gene by environment uh, studies. So um, combining information that we have, for instance, on per, a person's age, their uh, race, ethnicity, their comorbidities, other drugs that they're on. And um, I'm involved in this mostly with uh, diabetes medications, the newer diabetes med medications, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor antagonists. Um, and uh, we are looking at clinical trial data as well as observational data to um, determine uh, groups that benefit most from these drugs in terms of uh, hemoglobin A1C lowering as well as cardiovascular benefit. And um, as we um, are gaining more facility with uh, putting together complex data sets, um, we are using machine learning and other um, artificial intelligence uh, methods, um, including neural networks and, and, and deep learning to try to um, you know, get at better uh, disease prediction, uh, prevention, and more personalized treatment. Great. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this question. Uh, you know, pharmacogenomics are so important and they've been lacking in clinical trials. Should all 
clinical trials be required to have pharmacogenomic testing as part of the trial? Um, I'm biased, but my answer would be yes. Um, and actually, I'm working with a group at, at Harvard, uh, the multi-regional uh, clinical trials um, initiative. And, um, and we are working with uh, pharmaceutical groups to, um, one, increase diversity in clinical trials, and number two, understand the diversity in those clinical trials at the um, uh, pharmacogenomics level. And, um, you know, and this, uh, there's understandably some hesitation uh, in this and that you need larger and larger sample sizes to understand um, uh, treatment differences in, in subpopulations. But as we innovate in terms of um, lowering barriers to participation in clinical trials, lowering costs for clinical trials as, as the COVID clinical trials, have so um, beautifully taught us, uh, you know, we can be better about amassing large sample sizes and diverse uh, samples in short amount of time. Um, so again, um, you know, we, we are looking at the future of medicine with pharmacogenetic testing. And um, I'm confident that everyone on this call will have pharmacogenetic testing in their lifetimes. It's coming. Great, uh, we've got two minutes left. so. Let's let's broaden and, and lead off the answer you just gave. You mentioned increasing participation in clinical trials uh, several times so far uh, from Janine Sung. What communication approaches might lead and maybe other approaches might lead to greater participation in research from diverse communities? So how do we solve the problem of participation uh, from diverse communities that aren't uh, currently participating in re clinical research? Well, I want to thank you for that great question, and I want to do a quick shout out to uh, Janine Sung, um, who's who's part of our um, master's, new master's program in uh, big data and clinical informatics. Um, she's also um, a uh, the director of the Stanford Biobank. So thank you, Janine, for that question. And uh, and this is something that we talk a lot about in the biobank. How do we engage uh, diverse participants? Um, and, and part of that is, is having good community engagement. So I want to give a little shout out to Nina Lee at the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. So she's been marvelous in terms of, of connecting with um, Asian communities in particular and diverse communities in general um, and, 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 and providing um, bi-directional interaction. So these talks are an excellent example of that. Um, and, and other uh, content uh, that we're able to share so that um, patients are more aware of the benefits of participating in clinical research and are more likely to, to participate. Um, and also going to where patients are. So not expecting them to come to our academic centers, but there have been great studies, for instance, um, for hypertension reduction um, in barbershops in African-American populations. So, so going to where our, our patients are, I've, I've done um, interventions in, um, in temples and, and mosques and um, churches in the Bay Area. We also did um, uh, an intervention in taxi drivers at San Francisco airport because they often waited two hours to, to grab a fare. Um, and we did physical activity interventions there. So, so going to where our patients are as opposed to asking them to come to us is important. And then also uh, lowering barriers to participation. And this is something that the, the biobank aims to do. So, um, you know, not having to spend hours signing an informed consent and uh, coming, making a separate visit to get a blood drawn, but being able to um, piggyback on to a clinical visit, doing an informed consent electronically uh, through your phone or your iPad, and then um, just drawing an extra tube of blood when they're getting a blood drawn anyway, instead of um, sort of uh, creating more friction for, for patients. So lowering uh, participant burden is also important. So thank you. And then, um, and I hope someone can post on the chat um, the Stanford Research Registry. So, so this is a, a registry uh, which we've started for all um, race ethnic groups. 
at Stanford to incre increase diversity in clinical trials. Um, and you, you go in, you, you put in your information, some basic demographic information and some information about your health um, conditions and risks. And, and this way re researchers can re reach out to you quickly if you have um, uh, a, a condition of interest for the, for the research study. So please uh, register for the research registry as well. And does that include the biobank? Is are they one one of the audience members asked about whether the biobank is collecting specimens still? Yes, the biobank is uh, collect, collecting specimens, and if you register at the um, research registry, we will be able to reach out to you for the biobank. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Paul Niapon, for a wonderful talk. Many, many more questions, um, but uh, we don't have enough time today. Uh, but please uh, encourage the audience to join our future events, our future webinars. Our next big uh, care event will be a concert at 5.30 this Thursday celebrating Asian grandmothers, followed by a panel celebrating generations of Asian women featuring Fiona Ma, Fiona Ma the highest ranking Asian uh, political official in the state of California, and many, many others. Uh, please register at medmuse, M-E-D-M-U-S-E dot Stanford dot E-D-U. I uh, really appreciate all of your attention today, and please uh, join us for future events and future talks in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you.